Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the Commissariat Store in the Royal Historical Society of Queensland. My name is Dan Morgan. I'm a member of the uh, RHSQ Council and um, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today to hear the presentation by Paul Buddha about the Camp Columbia and the history of Dutch Ameri Australian American collaboration in Australia during World War II. Um, the Royal Historical Society of Queensland acknowledges the traditional custodians of the place on which we meet. We pay our respects to their elders. Um, Paul's uh, uh, impressive and extensive biography is uh, something uh, which we've seen on the invitation and on the website, and I won't rehearse it here. Uh, it's far too long and impressive and uh, um, puts the rest of us in the shade. So we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, a, a, such a, uh, a, an experienced speaker presenting uh, an important topic here today. Uh, by way of introduction, the, these are the facts that I have to remind myself of, um, so perhaps it's not just me. Um, but the Dutch East Indies campaign began on the 8th of December 1941 with the declaration of war on Japan by the Netherlands. Uh, the, soon after the declaration, the Royal Netherlands Navy ships and the Air Force were mobilised. The colonial assets in the Dutch East Indies included uh, prized oil resources. Borneo was attacked by Japan on 17th of December 1941. Uh, and then uh, Japanese forces continued to spread in a three-pronged attack uh, with an attempt to secure those oil reserves. Places like Sandakan, Borneo, Balikpapan, Timor all became part of the Australian folklore, normally, normally uh, uh, infamous rather than famous uh, later in the campaign with their associations with um, the, the, the war against the Japanese. But back in 1941, American, United States, British and Dutch forces, the colonial powers uh, at the time, combined under a uh, central command under uh, Field Marshal Wavell, um, their uh, combined forces. Um, the, uh, the naval assets, which are perhaps better known in Australia, um, eventually uh, fought three um, well-known battles, uh, the first, of, first and second uh, uh, battles of the Java Sea and the Battle of the Sunda Strait, where uh, uh, HMA uh, ships Hobart and Perth were sunk and uh, HMS Exeter um, and uh, the uh, Dutch ships De Reuter, Java and Tromp. Um, the uh, American battles um, involving Coral Sea, Midway, um, and the Australian experience in the bombing of Darwin, perhaps better known, but Paul uh, today is uh, going to tell us um, some stories uh, closer to home, which we uh, should know, and which add a, uh, an interesting and a more complex nuance to uh, the Brisbane experience. Um, so without any more contribution from me, please welcome Paul Hulda. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Don, and uh, welcome everybody, and uh, it's great to see you uh, here, and uh, I'm looking forward to talk a little bit about uh, the history that Don uh, started to introduce, and what then also, of course, the role was of the Allied forces, including the Dutch who, um, who arrived in, uh, in Australia, and particularly in, uh, in, in Brisbane. Uh, so my background is, uh, I love history, uh, uh, I'm not an historian, um, but um, uh, I came to Brisbane only three years ago, and then the first thing that I want to know is what's Brisbane all about with history. And I was the chair of the um, Convict Trail project in New South Wales, looking after the Convict Road between Sydney and the Hunter Valley. Um, that was uh, you know, a project I was interested in, so one of the first buildings I saw in Brisbane, of course, was this building. Yeah, and I went to the museum and familiarized myself with some of the convict history of, uh, of Brisbane and uh, early, early Brisbane history and uh, fascinating to learn more about, about the city. And being of, my, of Dutch heritage, uh, of course I came across uh, various sort of little bits of Dutch history 
but I was totally amazed when I came across Camp Columbia, uh, which is now Waco, of course, and full of present prisons and, and uh, uh, buildings there, and to find out that actually there was a, a Dutch uh, East Indies government in exile here in Brisbane, the only time that there was such an, a government a uh, foreign government on, uh, on Australian soil has never been since. Um, the Dutch didn't know about it, the Australians didn't know about it, so you know we started to uh, explore that, uh, uh, that, that whole history and, and particularly Jack, your history uh, here was enormously helpful in that. Jack wrote an, um, a thesis and a book about it in, uh, back in 1996, around that time and um, that uh, provided information. Interesting when I spoke to Jack about it, yeah, that at that point in time, the Dutch were not all that very interested in this. Because what happened, yeah, after the liberation of the Dutch East Indies, then uh, the Dutch thought, hey, you know, we recolonize uh, the Dutch East Indies again. And the people in, in, in Dutch East Indies, the Indonesians said, you know, over my dead body, <laughs> literally, yeah. And so, in the end, uh, the Dutch were adamant, you know, they sent military, etc. But in the end, of course, they lost the cause. So, you know, it became a black, uh, a black page in the Dutch history. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Uh, you know, it was, was put away. And that's why, you know, there is not a lot of, um, uh, a lot of knowledge about this uh, bit of history. And it's only in the last 10 years that the Dutch are actually starting to uh, recognize uh, that whole little uh, history and uh, you know starting to uh, to see what's happening on the australian side because you know there was such a little, little um, bit of history about it you know nobody really cared about camp columbia after the world after world war ii of course everybody was far too busy with rebuilding their life and things like that so the history of camp columbia in general not just the dutch bit but the whole camp columbia also disappeared yeah Buildings around, around uh, you know, were put there. Actually, whole suburbs were put in the, in the, in those areas, and there's hardly any anything left. So that's the combination of uh, the the Dutch and the Australian interest in this. That is actually going to uh, uh, starting to look at. Um, um, okay, let me use the, this one. That's uh, starting to look at uh, the the future of this site. So. Um, uh, approximately a year ago, just, just less than a year ago, um, uh, the uh, University of Queensland finished a historic and uh, archaeological uh, research of the site. Uh, then, basically, what we found, you know, there's nothing actually on the site where actually the prison is. That's where the head office of Camp Columbia was. But thanks to a couple of uh, people that uh, were involved in. Um, and, and um, uh, looking at, at artifacts that are hidden in the ground and uh, detectors, looking metal detectors and using that. They said, ah, Paul, you're, you're looking at the wrong site. And they took me to Pooh's Corner, yeah, where there's the, the bush reserve. And there we actually did find some, uh, some remnants uh, of buildings. Uh, there's a whole sewerage plant is still there, etc. And then uh, we made contact with Ed Parker, who's just making a picture here. Uh, who is, in, uh, is involved in Pooh Corner and we very quickly formed an, uh, an association with them and started to look at how can we uh, uh, make sure that the, 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 the uh, remnants of the camp that are there that we can protect and things like that. So that set the whole thing in motion. We started Bristol City Council, the first thing they asked us say, please put a heritage listing in place because they actually wanted to stop the, the people with metal detectors taking everything away. Uh, on the other side, I'm very, very grateful that these people do exist because they were the only one, only people that actually put some uh, interest in the site and actually preserved quite a lot of the remnants and you will see some of that uh, later on. Uh, so that's what the, the, the Heritage Association is in. And I did ask uh, the, 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 the Royal Historical Society to actually uh, support that and I received a nice uh, letter from uh, Denver that uh, the, uh, the, the Royal Historical Society supports this project uh, and that's what we go to. So the Dutch government supported, Brisbane City Council supported 
And as uh, Dom already mentioned, it's an allied project. So we like to include the Americans and um, uh, perhaps the British were not really involved in it, but you know, we like to make it an allied project and have uh, a look at, at um, how we can preserve and how we can actually promote and uh, provide information about, about that. So we, we just recognize the uh, Aboriginal people, the Turbul and Yagara people, but uh, we also investigated what happened in that site. We talked to Waco. Waco itself didn't have a camp, an, an Aboriginal camp. I checked that with Ray Kerrick over, the, the, the guy that also of Dutch descent, by the way, that he, he writes uh, interesting books and a lot of information about the Aboriginal history of Brisbane and Southeast Queensland. And uh, there was a camp in Goodna, yeah. Uh, but what the average, we spoke to some Aboriginal people and uh, elders, and they were talking about this was hunting ground. So they used it for hunting. It was also close to the river, so they used it for fishing and, and things like that as well. Already in the 1840s, you know, at that very, very early stage of, uh, of Brisbane, yeah, uh, the, Dr. Stephen Simpson started to uh, put some um, uh, police station there, border control station there. The Wollstone House, of course, is still there where uh, what that was his house. So, you know, there was already, from a very early uh, early state, there was a military uh, connection with that site. That only continued. I think it's a bit of um, uh, chance that it all happened, but, you know, it, it did happen. It's really interesting to see that, yeah? Uh, they uh, started to put a rifle range there. That was never used, by the way, but the rifle range was, was, was put there. Then the, um, uh, the asylum was also used by the military for ex ex exercises and things like that. All the way through history, there is an, a military connection with the Waco, uh, Waco environment. And uh, then eventually, of course, uh, World War II, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the Americans came after the uh, fall of um, uh, the, the Battle of uh, Pearl Harbor, and they started to set up Camp, uh, Camp Columbia. So what we, uh, what we know about the, uh, the situation in the Southeast Pacific, and Don already were talking about it, the Dutch wanted to be uh, uh, neutral. They were neutral in World War I, and they thought, okay, no worries whatsoever, we will be neutral in World War II. Now, within 10 days, the Germans took over Ger uh, the Netherlands in uh, 19, uh, 1940, so that was the end of neutrality there. Uh, and then, of course, they still thought that they could be neutral in, um, uh, against the Japanese, uh, but nevertheless, they started secret negotiations with the Australians already back in the, in the 1940s and, and 1941. They wanted to keep it secret because they still believed that they could be neutral and the Japanese would not invade uh, the, the, what was called the Dutch, the Netherlands East Indies. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, and then at the very last uh, minute, uh, the Australian, British, Dutch, uh, the American, British, Dutch, Australian command was set up under um, uh, uh, Wavell, as, as you already mentioned. And they lasted only a couple of months because they were, you know, there, there was absolutely no way that they could uh, defend the, the Southeast Asia and the, and, and the Pacific. I mean, Singapore was absolutely, totally believed by the Brits. They would never be able to uh, conquer Singapore. It was taken in 10 days. Yeah? It was just absolutely amazing. The whole Malay and the Palinchina, yeah? you know, another month. It was just unbelievable how strong the Japanese were and how modern their, their military was in comparison to uh, what the, the Allies uh, allied had. The Australians totally relied on the Brits for their uh, uh, foreign policy and, and defense and things like that. And of course, you know, the, the Brits the, um, you know, decided to leave Southeast Asia alongside uh, and, and move to, to, um, uh, to Europe to support uh, the, the forces there. And Australia sent letters to Churchill, you know, that they were very disappointed and things like that. that the British were abandoning Australia, but nevertheless, it, uh, it, it happened. Then, in, on the 8th of March, on the 9th of March, the surrender of the Dutch East Indies took place. It started, as Don mentioned already, in Borneo in, in December, and slowly the Japanese moved on. Still, you know, the Dutch were able for three months to 
fight the battle against the Japanese, but in the end, obviously, they also had to give in. Uh, the Dutch government was at that point point in London, because, of course, the Netherlands was occupied by the Germans. So the Dutch government in exile was in London, and they said, we are not going to give in, uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in the Dutch East Indies. You guys have to fight till you die. Fortunately, a few uh, colonel, colonels and captains and what have you said, this is impossible, this is useless. Yeah? And in the week before the surrender, they started to, make, uh, to do some evacuation to Australia. Only a week before the, um, before the, um, uh, the surrender, at the very last moment, and only some top, top people were, were allowed to move out. Family were not allowed to move with the people to Australia to evacuate. It was panic, chaos, disaster, what happened. Nevertheless, yeah, some 20,000 Dutch people, um, and mainly people that were on ships, that, that the ships were stranded yeah, uh, anywhere in the world. Yeah, they couldn't go to the Netherlands. They couldn't go to the Dutch East Indies. So you know, the decision was made that the merchant ships, the Navy ships, uh, the, the Air Force that was able to, to escape, all concentrated in, uh, in Australia. There was, uh, part of the Navy was also in Colombo, in, in Ceylon, yeah, Sri Lanka, uh, because the, the Indonesian archipelago is 5,000 kilometers in size, yeah, if you look across. So you know, some parts are far closer to India yeah, than they are to Australia. So in that situation, the, there, was, there were some uh, Navy, uh, the, the Navy the command was, was actually in Colombo. But the majority of the Dutch forces that were uh, able to escape you know, ended up in, um, in Australia. Uh, then, uh, in, uh, in 1942, after the, uh, the surrender, you know, then the, the, the Allied regrouped you know, the ABDA command, as I mentioned before, that um, was basically dis disbanded and, and the Americans left, the British left, and Australia and, uh, and the Dutch were actually left over to defend Australia because at that point in time uh, everybody thought you know, that Australia would be the next target of the Japanese and they would actually come to, um, uh, to, uh, to Australia. In hindsight, and we only know that of course later on with the Japanese archives, yeah, the Japanese had never at that point in time uh, had the plan to invade Australia. They had made the plan, we first settle ourselves in the, in the Pacific, we secure our position there, we make sure that everything works there, then we actually start going to Southeast Asia, and they wanted to go into uh, Sri Lanka, India, and then if that, uh, if that was also safe, they would then invade Australia. The problem with Australia was that they needed some 20 or 40,000 ground troops yeah, to actually go into Australia. So that was, that was one of the key reasons why they left Australia to, to, the, to the last. That's once again only, that information only, came only available after the war. So when the war was happening, obviously everybody was worried that they would, uh, they would conquer um, Australia as well. In the end, the reason why Darwin was bombed was to actually stop the supply line yeah, from the Allied forces to um, uh, uh, you know, to uh, the South Pacific, the Americans, etc. So that was the reason for Darwin to be bombed. So that's why they bombed the port, the airfields, and also you know the same with uh, with Townsville and Broome and, and things like that. They wanted to just make sure that there would not not be a supply line from the Allied forces into uh, the South Pacific uh, area. All right. Quick one, I mean, it's hard to see, but you know, here you've got Australia, then you've got the, um, uh, the, all the Japanese activities on this side, and then slowly, of course, the um, Allied forces, mainly, we're talking mainly about the Americans, of course, yeah, that started to uh, come into the scene. They decided in the end not to go to the Dutch East Indies, but go to the Philippines, so in order to uh, cut off the uh, supply line from the Japanese into, into the war area. Yeah? So that was one of the key reasons. The other key reasons was that MacArthur was furious that he was actually uh, sent out of, Jap uh, out of the Philippines by, by the Japanese. So he, f he felt it as a personal issue that he, and he has, when he came to Australia, he said, we will be back yeah, in the Philippines. And he made sure that that happened and he bypassed the Dutch East Indies and actually uh, 
to stop the liberating and then or stop at the end of the war uh, by going into the Philippines and then get the surrender of, um, uh, of Japan after the, uh, the horrendous um, atom bombs yeah, that, uh, that were detonated uh, there. Okay, so that's uh, a bit setting the scene. So everybody asks, why do we have Camp Columbia? What's that that, that is? Now, I didn't know, but it is apparently the person, the female personification from, uh, of, of America. You also have the, 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 the famous um, University of Columbia, yeah? Uh, so there are a couple of uh, Columbia, Columbia sort of um, uh, areas that, uh, that where, the, where that name is used. But that's the reason why. Now, if you now go to Brisbane, uh, then we see an area of about 15 by 20 kilometers, yeah? That was actually the extended Camp Columbia. Camp Columbia head office, the headquarters, was, at, at, was, was where uh, the prison now is, yeah? But there was an enormous area, yeah? Where all of these activities uh, took place. So there was ammunition, there were transport, there were camps for the blacks. Because you know this was uh, this was still a situation of segregation in America. Yeah, uh, you had all sorts of facilities across this area. So many of the suburbs that have been built on top of it, I would I would easily say 90, 90, 95 percent of the people would not know that they actually are in this particular area uh, of what was so important in, in World War II. Yeah. So the base, the, the, the main staging camp here in Waco, yeah, was where, where the activities are, are being play, uh, taking place. And part of this area here, yeah, is where, um, where the Pooh Corner area is, yeah, and where we still have the remnants of this area. So the actual headquarters on that side, uh, nothing is left. I'll show you some, some, uh, uh, some uh, slides from the, the university where we start talking uh, about what's, uh, what's uh, what happened with the archaeological dig that they uh, did there. But I think this is a fantastic uh, map, yeah? Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that, again, you know, people in Brisbane don't, don't really, yeah, uh, understand, know what this is all about. So our, if we start talking about the Camp Columbia here, yeah, hopefully, and that, you know, might take many years, that we will also start recognizing through plaques or, you know, little things like that what happened in the other part of the area. I think the, 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 the Brisbane was the most important uh, area yep, for where the South Pacific War was fought. It's the most important staging camp, yeah? Uh, okay, we talk about it, we have, we've got, the, camp, we've got uh, the MacArthur's headquarters and we've got a couple of, of, couple of sites, but I think, and as I spoke to Brisbane Council about it, you know, that we have to bring the whole lot together, yeah? So it's, you know, it's so that we get a total picture of the enormous importance of Brisbane, yeah? Not just for Australia, but for the world, yeah? For the, all the Allied forces, yeah? The importance of Brisbane in that broader context, yeah? Of, of um, you know, Camp Victoria and Victoria Park, yeah? Of course, the, the, the port, you know, with the, the submarines and, and, the, and, the, and the shipping. Uh, all, we've got little bits and pieces well documented and also nice plaques and things like that. But I would like to bring the whole world together, and we can do that through websites and fall brochures, etc., walking tours, yeah, um, traveling tours, etc. So that's part of the the, the, the big picture of the um, of Camp Columbia as well. So if you start looking at some of the uh, uh, Camp Columbia what's uh, itself, yeah. So here you see a transport unit. Here you see a, an ammunition depot, depot yeah. Uh, here's part of Freeman's camp, that was where the blacks were, yeah? They were not allowed to, um, uh, to be together with the whites. The black people had to stay in, in South Brisbane, and the white people, the white American, white American uh, soldiers and staff were in the, in the northern part of Brisbane. Fortunately, the southern part of Brisbane became far more interesting for the, for the Brisbane people because there were jazz clubs, the, the blacks brought all sorts of interesting music, and the action took place in uh, in, uh, in South Brisbane, yeah, where there were lots of uh, uh, lots of activities with the Black Americans. Yeah. Here's the hospital. There were two hospitals. This is how a hospital uh, train arrives in Waco, and how you know the, the injured were uh, transported in and out of the uh, of the of the trains. Yeah. So. Um, 
all are interested in things that, that people don't really, you know, of course, you know, I was in the Maritime Museum the other day and they have information about the fact that the Six United, uh, the, the uh, Seventh Fleet was formed in Brisbane. The Seventh Fleet was formed in Brisbane. Yeah? Hey, I mean, okay, you put a plaque in of an, a bit of a display in, uh, in the Maritime Museum, but in the total picture, the total story, yeah, it should be brought together all together. Yeah? The Sixth Army was formed in Brisbane. Yeah? The Seventh Fleet, at that point in time, a third of the ships were Dutch ships, another third were Australian ships. You know, Americans take all the credit for the Seventh Fleet. Hey, when it all happened, yeah, they only had a third of the ships. Yeah? So, you know, that are the sort of things. American, of course, dominates very easily in, in, these, sort of, in these sort of World War II stories. But it's important to also highlight the Australian and the, um, uh, and the Dutch or the Allies. I don't want to overestimate the Dutch. They're 20,000 people. I mean, you know, you talk about a million Americans that went through Brisbane. You know, you talk about, you know, how many million Australians. Yeah. So I don't want to overemphasize the, the the contribution of the Dutch, but you know, they they were definitely part. Of it. So they took over when uh, when MacArthur um, uh, conquered Hollandia in Dutch New Guinea, yeah, the other side of Papua New Guinea. So the capital of Dutch New Guinea was called Hollandia. And then he moved the camp from Brisbane to Hollandia. And from Holland Hollandia, you know, they then started to conquer uh, the, uh, the, 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 the battle towards, towards uh, the Philippines. Yeah? So in 1944, the Dutch took over uh, the whole of Camp Columbia. And uh, because they brought their, uh, they had people in Melbourne, and they had people in Perth, they had people in Sydney, lots of people in Brisbane, but they brought them all together in Camp Columbia and the headquarters you can see the Dutch flag and you see the, you know, something happening there. Uh, this was Camp Columbia, yeah, that's, uh, and there's, I think some of these pictures are from Jane uh, Schiffgaard, uh, Jack, you know, yeah. So uh, Jack had correspondence with one of the secretaries who operated in the, who was, who was working in, in the camp during the Dutch, um, uh, when the Dutch uh, operated from there. And um, she wrote a letter to Jack about, you know, the history of what she remembered from that and, and pictures that she had. So there's a couple of pictures here. And this, I think, Ed, you have to help me with that. This is the last cabin, the last uh, barrack, yeah, that uh, was uh, in the area. And we know a person that actually lived there. Remember that? Uh, yes, yeah, uh, Vicky, Vicky, uh, not Vicky, uh, yeah, Bernie's vault. Yeah, yeah. So this was the last hut. So after the um, uh, the, the Dutch left, yeah, eventually in '47. I mean, in '40, because they couldn't immediately go back because the Netherlands East Indies were not liberated. The Japanese were ex still in charge, and the Allied forces had actually mentioned to the Japanese, "You have to um, um, guard, for example, the camps." There were hundred thousand European people in Japanese camps, and they were absolutely in a shocking situation. Well, lots of them were starving and, you know, mainly women and, and children, because the men were sent to the Burma Trail, were sent to Jap Japan factories, etc., etc. So women and children were there. But the Indonesians wanted to get independence, so they actually started to attack, yeah, the, the camps, yeah, and so the Japanese, funnily enough, yeah, had to defend yeah, these European people and Chinese people that were there in order to uh, in order to in order to survive. So therefore, it took much longer for the Dutch to actually set up proper uh, infrastructure again in Indonesia. Uh, of course, they went back already in 1946. But the last plane from the uh, the Dutch transport squadron left um, um, uh, Archfield Airport in September 1947. So until that time, yeah, that was happening. That uh, that uh, uh, was was still occupied. After that, and that's what I wanted to say, it became a rainfall migration camp. Yeah. So the barracks that were used by by the, the military, yeah, they were then used by migrants. Yeah. And this was one of the last huts that uh, uh, that were there. Uh, when we, we still know who uh, lived in that hut at uh, when that what then became a house, of course, proper, proper house. Yeah. Uh, before it was demolished. So you see those pictures, 
Um, here we see again the administration building. There was an officers, um, an officers um, school. And it's amazing how many high level Americans, yeah, uh, that later on became officers in the American, in the American um, uh, military, yeah, were actually trained here in Brisbane. You're talking about hundreds and hundreds of high ranking military officials in America, yeah, that became very important military people in America after the war who had the training here in Brisbane. Yeah? Very, this is the, the, the wax, the, the Women Army um, Corps. Yeah? This is the Dutch Women Army Corps, and here's the American Army Corps. They were in, uh, in Yoronga, and they uh, camped in, they had a camp in Yoronga together with the, the Americans. Yeah? And the women actually was uh, an, an, uh, helped with um, all sorts of things, you know, that could be uh, uh, in, the, in the medical sort of area, that could be in the school, that could be in, you know, uniform shops and uh, activities, Red Cross activities, etc. So it was quite an important role that the women played. And I'm currently talking to uh, the Yoronga um, uh, RSL, the Yoronga Council, Nicole Johnson, because, you know, I would like to see a plaque for the, the, the wax, yeah? Also in the Yoronga, in the Yoronga side, it's a bit of a bit of a problem area uh, politically, but that's another story. And here we are, Jack. Here are the pictures of uh, of the, the university students, yeah, that um, were doing the uh, archaeological work in uh, in, in uh, uh, where the headquarters was, yeah, on top of the hill. Where now the prison is. I mean, the disaster of getting access to that site, yeah? It's just shocking, yeah? And then when, you know, you, you're not allowed to do anything in, in view of where somebody else can walk. I mean, it was a total, total nightmare, yeah? To operate in, um, on that prison site. So we did have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of luck there. Uh, you know, we, there definitely some, some uh, foundations and things like that and pipes. But then when this happened, so I became a, um, a volunteer with the, with the group, yeah. from, with my, my interest and information on, on it, 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 it history. The university had received a grant from the Dutch government to do this. Yeah? And then I, I heard you know, from those people that were the, the detector people, yeah, that on the other side of the road, there were artifacts and there was still something left. So I said to the university, we should have a look on the other side. Oh, no, because the contract is with, you know, this side. We can't do anything else, blah, blah, blah. Of course, I'm not part of the university, so I went straight to the ambassador and said, okay, what do you want? You spent all this money, yeah? We, we're not going to find anything, but on the other side of the road, yeah? And she immediately said, go for it, yeah? <laughs> so because, you know, it's in the end, you want to show for something. You know, it's nice to have it on the prison there where nobody can come and have a look at, yeah? While on the other side of the road, yeah? Or already talking to, to Ed and people in, in, from the Pukoro Bush Reserve, yeah? And they were more than, more than cooperative and, and, and you know, much more co co than, than cooperative and actually uh, getting, getting that there. So then the university said, okay, fine, great. So they're now also part, of course, of the project. Uh, Ian, uh, Professor Ian Lilly, who was in charge of this project, is, here, yeah, is now also one of the board members of the, um, uh, the Chemical and Heritage Association. Yeah. But this is the work that, and that, that, the fact that they did it, I mean, let's be honest, if the university does some work and says it's important, that makes sense. If I say, you know, it's important, and people say, oh, that's nice, yeah. So, you know, having the university behind you, yeah, and having them as a supporter, yeah, is critical. And also when we then actually started to talk to the, the, the Dutch government back in the Netherlands and said, okay, you know, we now need some more money to uh, continue that. And they immediately said, okay, who's from the university is going to be there as well, yeah? We don't trust you, uh, your volunteers and, and, and amateurs, yeah? So, um, great, Ian is there, yeah? And uh, it's very helpful, very, a lot of knowledge. Uh, and um, and of course we now have our own historian on board, yeah, Jorien van Beuken. That you know happened, ha is is uh, also a university um, from the University of Queensland, 
and helping us with, uh, with uh, the project as well. Now, now we come into some of the remnants that we, that we still have. It's uh, hard to see, but the biggest part is this, you, it's so overgrown, yeah, that it's hard to see. But this is an enormous uh, plant, yeah, sewerage plant, yeah, that's what that, there's a second one that you can't see because of the bushes that's totally, um, but you can see, it's, it's a problem. It's all properly, it's good stuff, yeah, that we, we can protect. Here's the road, the went the road through it, there are culverts here, yeah, uh, eventually, we would like to have a bit of an, call it, restore the road to get access to a lot of these other things that are still there. You know, there's the original sewerage park, which is uh, still there, yeah? It's a very interesting technology. From a technology point of view, this sewerage site, I mean, the, 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 this sewerage site also, of course, became available to the, to the migrants. People in Brisbane were complaining. All these migrants yeah, and refugees have access to sewerage and we don't have it. Yeah? <laughs> so there was quite some, some, some information about So these are most likely remnants of, um, of lavatories or you know, things like that. There is, um, it's not on the picture here, but we've got slabs you know, where the huts were, um, yeah, some other sort of stuff. So it's lots of, lots of bits and pieces that are there. That we um, uh, that we want to protect, yeah, and uh, and to eventually, of course, show. So the next step, we've got to actually meet tomorrow, is that uh, we want at the the pool corner centre, we want actually to create an uh, an exhibition with pictures. We've got lots of pictures, as you already saw here, uh, and we want to put some QR codes in this area, that uh, uh, and a, and a big display at the beginning of of uh, pool corner park where we actually start talking about the history and start providing information about it. And if you then walk into the, into the reserve, there will be QR codes that provide further information. We have to take into account, and that's what um, the council told us, if you put up anything fancy, yeah, it gets vandalized. It's really a sorry story, you know, that as uh, that soon as you put a proper plaque there or whatever, yeah, you know, the cost of then maintaining the plaque, yeah? And, and obviously we don't have the money for that. So that's why most likely we'll have a display at the beginning. We do exhibitions at the, uh, uh, at the, at the center, and it can vary, you know, we can do. Uh, we also, in, by the way, incorporate Archifield Airport. Very, very cooperative. We can use their, um, their uh, arrival halls whenever we want for presentations and things like that. As I mentioned already before, the Dutch were there till 1947, so there's a rich history with uh, Archifield Airport as well, yeah, uh, in, uh, in World War II, but even before that. Because, you know, when, when the Dutch East Indies, uh, they were so far away from, uh, from Europe, yeah, uh, and uh, of course the, the, only, the, the, the only European country uh, was close to uh, the Dutch East Indies was uh, Australia, so there's a lot of history, of course you all know the Hard Talk and Dijfken and you know, the Batavia, etc. So that goes already back, you know, of course, hundreds and four hundred years. Yeah? But that has continued because when the first planes arrived, yeah, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, yeah, they flew via Australia, and Australia, you know, from Australia flies were, uh, you know, via Batavia, the, the capital of the Dutch East Indies, to Europe. So there has been this this history uh, of um, uh, the Dutch relationship with Australia. For, for many, many, many years, uh, for uh, several hundred years. This is some of the artifacts that, or some of the, 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 what we found in the ground, with the metal detector people found in the ground. I mean, this is only a small collection. I could have, you know, 20 slides like this. I was totally, totally amazed, yeah, when this, uh, the person who found these, yeah, uh, showed them to me and said, this is what we have. So that's the sort of thing if you start, you know, if you start thinking a little bit further, you start thinking about, you know, museum or display or whatever, yeah? We can actually, we have plenty of things to, you know, there's, of course, Dutch coins, Australian coins. It's mainly from this, the, 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 the later years. There's, we do have dog tags, yeah? Dog uh, from, uh, from uh, military. We actually found one and we've got the history of that person that got in one of the aviation people pirates that were killed 
uh, then uh, there are more more um, um, uh, dog tags that, that we have found and make contact with the family back in, in the Netherlands and Australia to find out, you know, in any case, let them know. So there's there's quite a lot of these sort of this part of the history that that's going on uh, as well. Yeah. So that's uh, that's all that, uh, that this is all found at Pooh Corner. Yeah. So where we want to create the heritage heritage um, uh, precinct. Yeah. Within within the park. So that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of stuff that's uh, that we're finding there. And then finally, the Wakefall Migration Camp. So they took over. So a lot of these huts, you see them, you know, very similar to the ones we saw. The Eagle huts, you know, the, a couple of them are now in use by the um, Papua New Guinea uh, military group, yeah? yeah? Do you know the correct name, uh, Jack? What's uh, Black Forces Association. Sorry? Black Forces Black Association. Black Forces Association, yeah. So we've got bits and pieces, you know, that, that are still there. And amazingly, some, uh, in some of the industrial sites, in that particular area, we find some of the eagle arts that people started to use for their factory or, or whatever. So there's a lot of history that um, that's there. Now, as we nowadays live in a time of truth telling, I think it's also important to um, uh, to mention a few of these more darker sides of what happened. Yeah. Um, so while the Dutch East Indies, of course, you know, the majority of people were of you know were of color, yeah, the, the brown people. And there was this huge battle between the Australian government and the Dutch government that, you know, when uh, um, uh, people from Indonesia, Indonesian people would come to Australia, they didn't like it. We had a white Australian policy. Yeah. So there were a lot of people that were refused. Yeah? Finally, they actually were, provide, were given because the Australian government couldn't send them all back. Yeah? And they arrived on ship. Where, had they, where did they have to go to? They couldn't go anywhere else than in Australia. So the Dutch government had to sign a, um, uh, an agreement that soon after the war, all these people would go back to, to Indonesia. So there was a lot of battle going on in that, in that particular area. The Dutch also, of course, you know, did some uh, terrible things. Yeah? They, uh, and, and, and in the end, it's an, an, an interesting story. So there was a, uh, a military prisoners camp, a prisoners group, an, 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 a concentration camp in Papua New Guinea, in Dutch New Guinea, sorry, uh, Tanamera. And they had, an, the Dutch, the Indonesians had an uprising in 1925-1926, and the ringleaders and their families were transported to the jungle in Dutch New Guinea, and they were put in a camp there. When the, when the war broke out, the Dutch were worried that those people would go over to the Japanese and became you know, part of the Japanese um, intelligence. All, most of these people were highly educated people, highly educated Indonesian people. Some became ministers later on. Yeah? So uh, then the, uh, what the Dutch said to the um, uh, Australians, we've got prisoners of war, and they brought them to Australia. And then these prisoners of war said, no, we are political prisoners. We are not uh, uh, prisoners of war. And then the Australian unions said, you can't do that. This is in, the unions, you know, this is the time, the, golden days of the unions. They were so incredibly powerful. Yeah? So the unions were informed that these people were uh, political prisoners and they said to the Australian government, you know, you can't have political prisoners from a foreign country on our, on our ground. The Dutch, of course, resisted, but in the end, by the end of uh, 1942, December 1942, they had to let them go. These were highly intelligent Indonesian people. Guess what they did? They started to form a resistance. In Australia, yeah, and they became uh, a very important force. And you might have heard of the Black Armada, yeah, that was the boycott, that the largest maritime boycott that ever existed in the world, yeah, uh, and that was black, black, uh, how do you call it, uh, black or blacking all of the Dutch shipping after the war, 1945, 1946, going to uh, the Dutch East Indies to stop the recolonization. Of uh, uh, that, that, that the Dutch wanted to do, so that's called the Black Black Armada, and uh, the Indonesian part of the resistance, yeah, and, and they are uh, as freedom freedom fighters, a very important part of the history, goes back to uh, to Australia as well. Then, of course, you know, you had, as I already mentioned, you know, the Dutch fought two wars. They call it police actions. Hello, 
uh, two wars in uh, the Dutch East Indies, yeah, uh, in order to try and, uh, and maintain their colony. 25% of Dutch GDP dependent on, uh, on, on the Dutch East Indies. As John mentioned, oil, yeah, rubber, yeah. Lots of that stuff, you know, came from, uh, from the Dutch East Indies. So uh, there was also an economic reason why they did it, but it was mainly a political reason, yeah. Very conservative Dutch government at the time, yeah, who said, you know, we are the, yeah, the colony, uh, we, we own that colony already for 400 years, we should go back there. Of course, it didn't work out. And then uh, the, um, um, uh, in the end, of course, Indonesia got, got um, the um, uh, freedom. In the meantime, Australia said, ah, this is all going on. It's far too close to us. Let us take over Timor and the Netherlands, Dutch, East Indi Dutch uh, New Guinea, because that's pretty close to Australia. Yeah? So they actually started to um, uh, talk to the Americans that they could actually take over. Yeah? Timor and uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Dutch, New, Dutch New Guinea area. Of course, in the end, that didn't work. But you know, you see all of these political things that are happening at that uh, at that time at that time as well. As also mentioned, the Indonesians are not going out free as well. Yeah, it's called Bersiap. Yeah, and there was absolutely mass killing of women and women and children. Yeah, that took place after the war. Uh, when you know there was this vacuum of power, yeah? and um, it's only actually in the last couple of weeks, yeah, that the Indonesian government is talking about some of the bad things that happened on the on the Indonesian side. It's for everybody incredibly difficult, you know, to talk about the bad things that happened in their in their uh, country. On the positive side. Uh, Australia actually totally changed um, um, the situation <coughs> after the war. During the war, they totally supported the Dutch, as I tell you, the Dutch, the Netherlands, East Indies government in exile. Dutch military could walk around in Australia with guns, could arrest people, Dutch people. Yeah, they were totally in charge of, of their own operation and could do basically what they want yeah, uh, in, in that situation. So the, the Australians had given the Dutch full support in that area. However, Australia is not a, colon, a, a colonizing company a co or country, nor are the Americans. So the, the, the Australians and the Americans were not happy that the Dutch wanted to recolonize the, uh, the Dutch East Indies. And they actually said, you know, these people need to have a, a say in that, in the, what is going to happen there. Yeah? And then Australia started to play a leading role yeah, in the UN negotiations that started to take place in 1947-49, yeah, that eventually led to the, uh, to the, uh, to the independence, the, the acceptance of the independence of, um, of, uh, uh, of Indonesia. And the last bit was that, as I mentioned, that all these um, Indonesian people had to leave after the war. Yeah? <coughs> There's this lady of, of Ambon, the island of Ambon, and uh, her husband yeah, died in a, uh, uh, he was an, 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 official, an official of the Dutch, the Netherlands East Indies government, and he actually was killed in an accident that took place near Cairns, military and military um, plane uh, um, crashed in, um, in near Cairns, in Mosman, and um, they, the, the, they had seven children, and he, she was, you know, she didn't have money, she didn't have nothing. She married her household in Melbourne. And he was a white person, yeah? And lovely guy, looked after the family, etc., etc. But then after the war, they said, no, the, 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 the woman and the children have to go back to, uh, to Indonesia. That actually became a high court, a Supreme Court um, situation. And the high court of, of Australia decided that she was allowed to stay in Australia and that was the first crack in the white Australian policy. Then it still took till the 70s, 1970s, before that, that totally uh, finished. But, you know, so there are very different sort of angles to this, this whole story of, um, of the, Dutch, um, uh, the Dutch history in combination with, uh, with Australia, particularly during World War, World War II. So I think it's important to, that people in Australia also, also know, know this. The people in, in the Netherlands know more about this. Uh, it's good that, as I mentioned, we get the support of uh, the Dutch government, we get the support of Brisbane Council, uh, and we are going to turn this into an, uh, 
an heritage uh, uh, precinct where we can actually start talking about the, the story. And it's once again, it's an allied story. It's not the story about the Dutch. It's not the story about the Australians. It's the story about the allies. Yeah. So what 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 happened in that uh, in that uh, period? So that's basically my talk. Uh, there's more information. We've got a website. Yeah. If you do Camp Columbia, uh, you automatically will, will find it. Uh, you also see it here on the, on the site. Uh, we send out a monthly newsletter uh, with historic information, information of what's happening on the site, and uh, we, um, uh, we welcome you to support us in that way and, and, and also pass the message on uh, that this important heritage site in Brisbane is uh, what we, what we uh, you know, we start to ask for support and make sure that we go to preserve that for um, for our children and grandchildren. If we're not careful, you know, that this, this this bit of history, it's two minutes to twelve, give it another couple of years and everything is everything is gone. Yeah? So um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, how are you distinguishing the relics that were from the Dutch period to the relics that are on the same site from the, the migrant period in the 50s and 60s? Yeah, the good thing, of course, lots of them are coins. Coins have dates on them, yeah, so that helps yeah, in, in that situation. Uh, the people that came from the Netherlands um, to Wakefall after the war, yeah, would typically have Dutch money if they had money with them, or Australian money, yeah, but they wouldn't have uh, uh, money from the, the Netherlands East Indies, which were distinct, different uh, coins. Yeah, so there, that there's that combination. You saw in seniors with the with the, the Dutch line on the military. Yeah, we also did find uh, an, 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 a little tin of um, sun sunscreen, uh, typically wake all time. You know, the migrant sort of situation. So you can. Yeah, some of it will be difficult. There will always be some some uh, grey area. But most of it is quite clear, yeah. And particularly if you see the, the Australian military stuff, etc., yeah, then all of that clearly indicates, you know, that these are insignias and coins and and little bits and pieces that date back to the uh, to that to that area. Yeah. Good old question. Don't be coy. Thanks uh, very much, Paul. That was tremendous. Uh, can I just ask, though, the government was there. Uh, who comprised the government and how did the government operate as a government in exile? Did it have to go through London or operate in what format it operated? It would be quite restricted, I would think, but over to you. Uh, you. You see me already laughing. That is an absolutely disaster. Yeah? So here you've got the, uh, the Dutch have their government in exile in London, yeah, uh, they are adamant, you know, that Indonesia is recolonized. Then you've got the uh, so the governor, the, the Dutch governor, governor of um, uh, the, the Netherlands East Indies, decided to stay in uh, in uh, Batavia, and he was captured. He was put in a camp. But the assistants, yeah, just before that happened, days before the surrender, the his assistant, yeah, for Moak, yeah was actually made the new assistant governor and he was the one that escaped on the 7th of March, two days before, uh, to, uh, to Australia and he became the uh, person in charge of the Netherlands East, at that point in time it was called the Netherlands East Indies uh, uh, Commission for Australia and New Zealand, that was immediately called like that. That turned then later on in the Dutch, uh, in the Dutch Netherlands East Indies government in exile. But this Van you know, he was the important one. However, he was a person that said, we have to start looking, and this is then all to do about after the war. Yeah? So this government is all about what are we going to do once it's liberated, etc. Van Moog said, no, we have to start talking to the Indonesian people and give them more independence. Then the Prime Minister in the Netherlands, in London, yeah, said, no way. He recalled Van Moog to London yeah, uh, so that he could not directly influence it. 
and put his second person in charge, named Van der Plas, yeah, to actually start uh, being more aggressive towards the recolon recolonization. So that's one part where you continuously have this, this area. A second problem is, Don mentioned that the, the, the naval uh, commander was in Colombo. The naval commander in Colombo was made the, uh, the, the commander in, of, in charge of all the Dutch forces in Australia and in Southeast Asia. 90% of the people are in Australia, only 10% are in, in, in Ceylon. Yeah? This person, Helfrich, yeah, said to the Dutch government, you have to send me to Australia. No, said the Dutch, because that's where the Brits are, and the Brits, you know, we also have to maintain uh, in, uh, com uh, communication with the Brits, so we have one, one foot in the Brits camp and one foot in the American camp. Now, then, for you can imagine, yeah, that that did not run smoothly, yeah? There was no smooth operation, yeah? Then in between, you've got then the whole armed forces, the Australian armed forces, the Dutch armed forces, and of course the, the American armed forces, were all under American command. So in the end, it were the Americans who called the shots, yeah? Who were actually saying, this is what's going to happen, yeah? So whatever the Dutch government wanted or didn't want or whatever, yeah? So they, the, in the end, it was MacArthur and his people that actually, on the military level, decided what was going to happen with the Dutch forces yeah, that were in, in Australia. They were not on, of course, there were squadrons. They had their own squadrons, the 18 squadron, the 120 squadron, yeah, the transport squadron, mainly in that area. And then, of course, all the Navy ships, the merchant ships were, you know, they were the majority part that looked after the whole um, a transport operation, if you talk about the Coral Sea, if you talk about Milne Bay, all Dutch ships that brought transports there looked after the, the, the hospital ships, etc. So an enormous Dutch merchant force yeah, was also part, but it was all part of the American force. The Americans were telling, you know, where they needed the ships, what the ships had to do, etc., etc., etc. So this, this all sort of conflicting, not conflicting, but a competing sort of interest of what the Dutch government in London wants, what this, this colonel and uh, the, the uh, admiral in Ceylon in, uh, wanted, what you know, the military here in Australia wanted, yeah? then the Americans, etc. Negotiated with the Australians. The Dutch needed an enormous amount of ammunition, of boats, of planes, of God knows whatever. There was no uh, production in Australia for that. Australians couldn't deliver. Yeah? So, you know, then it depended again on the Americans yeah, to deliver that. So, you can imagine the chaos, particularly in 1942. It wasn't until late 1943 that basically that started to settle down. That there were enough planes, there were enough ships, there was staff coming in, yeah, that could actually help and, and, and things like that. So, but imagine, and I, you know, thinking about it, yeah. So, in 10 days, Singapore fell, yeah. Two months later, this whole ABDA command collapsed. Yeah, Australia under under fire. Yeah, Darwin bombed, etc., etc. And none of them, none of the countries involved, were prepared at all. The Australians were not prepared. The Dutch were not prepared. The Americans were not prepared. The Brits were not prepared. So the chaos that you have in 1942 is enormous. Yeah, it's still a wonder, you know, that in the end and, and years later, yeah. Basically, uh, MacArthur, he was just such a strategist, yeah? It's absolutely unbelievable what, what, what he was able to, to, to get together and, and start taking back from, uh, from the Japanese. But it was one, one big disaster area in, for, for nearly, for, no, for more than a year, yeah? Before that actually settled, settled down. And, but then still the political battles continued, yeah? What are we going to do with the, 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 the Netherlands East Indies after the war, etc. yeah? Big, the, the Black Armada, the big boycott, etc. Still, what's happening? There's not a question here. Paul, I was just wanting to know: Are you going to write a book? No, <laughs> I'm not a book writer. Oh. Uh, we we have uh, the book from Jack is absolutely fantastic, yeah. And then, uh, and that's also mentioned on our site. I've got abstracts from from Jack's book on our site that, that you can have a look to and. There's reference to you know to the book from uh, from Jack, and perhaps Jack is going to re-publish uh, it if 
if that uh, yeah if we get enough enough uh, interest uh, back into into that area uh, my the information that we get is all on the website extensive articles yeah but not in a book format no Simon well, one of the legacies we've got um, from that time in history is the division of half life yeah you know east and west right down the middle um, it sounds like Australia had an opportunity to resolve that Sometimes, why do you think that didn't happen? Because of the pressure of the Americans and the threat of Indonesia to uh, become allies with Russia. Mm. So the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, that Sukarno, you know, the president of, of Indonesia, wanted the Dutch, uh, Papua, the Dutch Papua New, Dutch New Guinea, and uh, when they threatened that if they didn't get it, they would align themselves. And this is the Cold War, yeah. So this is now we're talking about the 1950s, 60s, etc. Yeah. So then he threatened that uh, he would invite the uh, the Russians to come in. Then the Americans said, "Over my dead body, that's not going to happen." So then the Americans decided that uh, Kennedy, Kennedy at that time, yeah, he decided that the, the Dutch should give uh, that to Indonesia. And now we still have the problem in West Papua, as it's called now. Yeah, where the Indonesian people are. are you do terrible things to the populace. Yeah. Was there an opportunity earlier, before all those geopolitical machinations, that maybe came down to Australia not really taking indigenous rights seriously? Yeah, I mean, all of that, yes. You know, this is still an era, yeah, where, you know, there's really the divide between white and, and, and black or brown or whatever you want to call it. You know? so, we still are in a time where the whites saw themselves as dominating mm -hmm. and you know it's not about giving the indonesians or giving the um, the papas freedom no 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 it's you know the australians said no we want to take it over yeah mm -hmm. not that they want to give it freedom no we want to take it over yeah so you know that is still you know we have to see it in the historic perspective yeah at that time these sort of issues were still at a very very early beginning yeah very early the other interesting thing now you're talking to me is that in Cooper's Plain, yeah, there is the other Dutch houses. Yeah? Simon is from that area, and the Dutch houses were, you know, after the war, the whole that whole area that you saw one of the first maps, yeah, that became suburbs, and Australia needed an enormous amount of, of uh, houses built, and Australian government, so the Queensland government went overseas to Italy, to the Netherlands, to France, etc. We want builders, yeah. Uh, who not uh, bring their own staff, bring their own materials, and start building houses in uh, in where the, the Camp Columbia camp, the broader Camp Columbia camp was, and there was some 300 Dutch houses built, and we're trying to solve, save one of them <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. I'd just like to say a couple of reminiscences. Uh, as an officer in the Army Reserve, the 214 Light Horse. I conducted exercises in that food corner, so I don't think I lost anything, but that's, ah. that's that. Uh, next, my uh, father served, uh, worked in the Dutch East Indies at the Dobo in Am uh, Dobo and Aru Islands from 25 to 1930. Uh, spoke the language and everything else. Uh, I had a, a friend who was a Dutch boy, my friend at school, his name was Dick Spronk. Uh, his older brother Peter was the first person that had been taken by a shark in 50 years on the Gold Coast in the 1950s. <laughs> and his younger brother, who was only about 18 or something, was hit by a car in Coonan Street at Indra Pillar, coming home at night trying to hitchhike. Most of the scene was killed. So, you know, these are little things. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Things we, you know, it's good that you mentioned because we are collecting as much as possible personal stories. Yeah? So personal stories from people that were in Wake personal stories, as, as we mentioned, the secretary that worked, uh, worked at Camp Columbia. Yeah, so we are gathering that sort, of, that sort of story because we like to make, and Jorin is very keen in that, that we like to make it a personal, as personal as possible rather than yeah, and, 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 and artifacts and whatever. Yeah? We really want to make that human story part, a uh, very important part of, of this area. So any information that you have, I we would love to add them. An uncle who was a uh, coast watcher in the Dutch uh, East Indies, he was uh, betrayed by the natives, the Japanese, executed in Ambon prison, along with his 19-year-old son. So he was two yeah. 
Yeah, I haven't. So okay, lovely. You know, we we should be in contact. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Paul, do you mind if I just follow up um, and answer the Debra's question about political situation? Yeah. Okay. So what basically what you had was um, an attitude very similar to the way the British treated um, British officials. Well, you get you get a microphone, Jack. Oh, One okay. second. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, you had a situation the same as the British treated us, the Dutch in Europe treated the, the, in, the Dutch and the Indonesians in the NEI, which was they were colonials. So they weren't quite as equal as anybody who was actually living in the Netherlands. And um, when Van Boek, as you said, was recalled because he was considered to be, and he was born in, in the Netherlands, East yeah. Indies, so he was recalled because he wasn't trusted, they replaced him, as you said, with Van der Plaas. But what they they were so silly because Van der Plas was actually Muslim and he was born in the Netherlands East Indies. So he was even more pro-Indonesian than Van der Mook. And in the end, in 1944, they had to send Van der Mook back to Australia because they couldn't trust their own man, Van der Plas. Yeah. It's very true. There was, there was a lot of distrust in London about what was happening here. And then obviously think about the distance, yeah, that's another sort of drama, yeah, that's taking place. But yeah, the political situation, you know, is, is really, really, if you, if you read about it, and it's afterwards, you know, of course it's all after the war that you can analyze that and, and, and see what it, but uh, yeah, it could have been much, could have been, could have done much better. <laughs> that sounds like a good point to call time for. Thank you so much on behalf of everybody here, a small token on behalf of the Associate of the uh, Society. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please thank Paul again. <laughs> it is being recorded. Eventually it will find its way onto our YouTube channel. Um, you'll be able to watch it all over again. Can I plug our next uh, lectures on the 10th of May, we'll be hearing from Keith Bolton about wrecks in Moreton Bay. And on the 14th of June, we'll be hearing from George Simons about Simons menswear, which will be well known label to lots of people in Brisbane. So again, thank you all very much. And um, uh, I've also got to plug the book sales at the end of the room where Ros is waiting to. Thank you all very much, and we look forward to seeing you in the future.